with uh, seven people. Okay, perfect. It's a great pleasure to have Professor Thomas Noche. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, <laughs> I pronounced well. Thank you very much, Thomas, for joining us today. So uh, Professor Noche actually uh, got his PhD in 1996 at the Technical University of the Twente, uh, Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he did his postdoc uh, at the uh, Max Planck for Cognitive Neuroscience Leipzig, Germany. And then he had uh, some R&D experience um, in, in the Netherlands. And then he joined as a scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences. And then he stayed there uh, from 2006 until now as a head of research and development group, MEG and Cortical Networks. And uh, today we have a privilege to have him uh, to explain uh, some of his research related to neural mass modeling of cortical and subcortical circuits. And thank you again, Thomas, for joining us today. And the ground is yours. Please uh, go for the uh, sharing your presentation and start the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Milad for this uh, nice introduction. First, I try sharing my screen. So, which one would it be? So, I guess you see my screen. It's it's perfect. Yes. So I just have to move the video somewhere else. It wouldn't obscure my screen. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Thomas Knirscher. I'm heading, the, as already mentioned, the Brain Networks Group at the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences in Leipzig, which is, by the way, the same institute that has been mentioned before, uh, the Max Planck Institute for uh, Cognitive and Brain Science. No, what was it before? Neuropsychological Research, exactly. That was only renamed. So I have been at this institute for quite a while already. Um, and done a lot of research there in different areas. Today, I would like to talk to you about neural mass modeling. Um, but before that, I would like to introduce in two slides um, the Brain Networks Group. Um, the mission of that group is based on the assumption, I call it an assumption, that selection, exchange, and integration of information via complex neuronal networks is the basis of the performance of the human brain at all levels. That is an assumption in so far that uh, we all know that there are other constituents of the nervous system and also the wider body that make contributions to information processing. But here we stick to the so-called neuronal doctrine, um, assuming that the network of neurons has, at least plays a decisive and central role. And therefore, our mission is to develop methods to investigate, model, and understand these networks in order to eventually understand how they give rise to information processing and cognition. And we approach this goal from different angles. In the past, we did a lot of research on structural connectivity. So we looked at, uh, through non-invasive methods like DDI, we looked at um, fiber tracts, how they connect different parts of the brain and how that matches theories of um, how uh, cognition actually works. Nowadays, um, we are more focused on biologically realistic modeling of the dynamics of neural circuitry at the local cortical level, but also at long range connectivity. And eventually we want to look at uh, whole brain networks in order to identify the mechanisms of information processing and cognition. Um, we also use such models for the interpretation of functional brain data, especially non-invasive brain data like EEG and MEG. And a big topic in our group is modeling the mechanisms of non-invasive brain stimulation, in particular TMS. So if you want to model brain function, uh, we have to consider that brain function can be uh, cons or looked at at different levels of abstraction. David Mara in his seminar 82 paper has defined three different levels of modeling. You can easily enhance this in a more fine-grained manner. So he defined a computational level where you formulate goals and problems 
an algorithmic or representational level where cognitive processes are defined to reach these goals. And finally, the implementation levels where the neural mechanisms and the biophysical um, processes are defined that implement these algorithms and representations. This implementation level is often considered um, not so important. Many cognitive neuroscientists or computational, sorry, many computational neuroscientists say, okay, um, it doesn't matter how it is actually implemented. Uh, there are different ways to implement it. However, I would say that not only the higher levels determine the lower levels, but also the lower levels, including the implementation level, put constraints on the higher levels. They define what is actually possible and uh, what is not possible uh, by the biological substrate that we actually have. That's why I would like to, to focus on this implementation level here. Moreover, uh, the impl implementation level is where the interface to other domains of research of science actually is situated. Biology in the wider sense, in particular also in neurology, what is the impact of lesions? How do particular drugs uh, influence our cognition and so on? And if you want to um, study the implementation level, as already mentioned, uh, we stick to the neuronal doctrine that means we have to look at neurons. Neurons are amazing little machines. Um, they are capable of a lot um, of um, information processing. They represent information by their spike rates and membrane potentials being the state variables. Uh, tra the transition between the two through the synaptic dendritic complex uh, implements integration of information in space and time. Uh, information is categorized uh, by nonlinear transfer functions at the axonal hillock, for example, and transmitted between neurons. And most importantly, information can also be stored by means of plastic changes in certain properties of neurons. However, these cells are quite similar, at least among mammals. So, but yet the cognitive abilities um, across these um, animals are quite different. That means the connectivity between these neurons must be a crucial factor. There are different ways neurons can be uh, connected, so-called motives. Locally, uh, we have feed forward, excitation, inhibition, convergence and divergent patterns. Um, but also, very importantly, feedback loops that play a very important role, especially in the cortex. And that all exists also at the global level, where um, parts of the brain, brain areas representing different types of information are represented and integrated. And all, of course, everything in between. So, and all this recurrent connectivity, spatial temporal integration, and nonlinearity give rise to a rich repertoire of spatial temporal dynamics that we can observe by intra and extracranial recordings, such as transient responses to stimuli and changes in the environment, all sorts of oscillations, synchronization between oscillations, coupling also across frequencies bursting behavior, so transient oscillatory patterns, um, spatial temporal patterns like standing or traveling waves, other types of uh, pattern representations and even chaotic behavior. In order to link these dynamics to the biological substrate and eventually to behavior and cognition, we need to model these neurons mathematically. Um, there are different neural models around. They differ or they can be aligned along a scale uh, from maximum realism and minimum simplicity and tractability to just the opposite. The maximally realistic type of modeling of neurons are compartment models that really account for the neuron morphology and in detail also for the, all the channel dynamics and everything. If we shrink everything to a point, then we have the classical Hodgkin-Huxley approach um, there are several simplifications of this. 
Um, if we introduce more simplified artificial threshold mechanisms for firing, then we have the classical leaky integrated fire neuron. And um, we can then go further to firing rate models, replacing single action potentials by firing rates, and eventually cluster um, many neurons into neural populations or neural masses that then describe their collective behavior uh, by their statistical moments. In most cases, just the means. And here in this presentation, as the title already um, told you, uh, I would like to focus on this type of modeling, um, which, as I have already mentioned, if I have very many neurons, for example, in the cortical column, uh, more than 10,000 10, neurons, then we clustered similar neurons together in neural masses, each of which described by a mean membrane potential and the mean firing rate. So the first moments uh, of the statistics of these state variables. The clustering is done according, yeah, it's, it's a bit variable how clustering is being done, but main criteria are spatial proximity, similar physiology being excitatory or inhibitory neurons, for example, similar input and output patterns. So why is this whole thing useful? Why do, are we doing this? Um, it being such an abstraction from the real system. The argument that everybody dealing with this matter would come up with is uh, the tractability argument. Any sizable part of the brain or any um, serious cognitive or information processing um, operation modeled by a single neural network would end up in an astronomic number of nodes and parameters. This not only hampers computability, there we could still argue, okay, let's just let's wait for five years and then the computers will be able to do that. But it also prevents mathematical and conceptual understanding. So we would be not able to see the forest for the tree, to, so to speak. Another argument is specifiability. We just have not enough anatomical and physiological knowledge to really parameterize a, such a network on a single neural net level. Also for fitting and comparing with reality, um, the observability that we have, especially in non-invasive uh, brain research, is always uh, constant, uh, always refers to simultaneous activity of entire populations of neurons. And even if in some cases in animal research, for example, we can monitor a single neuron activity, then we can only monitor a few of them um, and not the whole thing. And finally, uh, there is an argument of relevance. There has been a lot of argumentation, for example, by Walter Freeman, that uh, there are masses or populations of neurons that are very densely interconnected and have common input and output uh, connections so that they uh, act as a whole, basically, and as a mass actually form a basis of cognitive operations. That does not mean uh, that single neurons don't play a role. There are certain things where we really have to look at uh, single neurons, but a sizable part of uh, the information processing in the brain is based on mass action. So that's why we are using neural population models. Um, there have been a number of uh, such models proposed in the last decades. Um, the most famous, famous ones uh, by Wilson Cohen, for example, and by um, Janssen and Ritt. Recently, or maybe first of all, sorry, I just got confused here with my slides. Um, classical models um, are often very empirical. So they try to mimic the behavior of an entire population, of the mean of an entire population of neurons, uh, just an analogy to single neurons. This usually assumes that the neurons within a mass don't interact with each other. You have a lot of parallel channels that are more, more or less independent. Then it's easy to make the move from a single neuron model to a mean field model of an entire population. However, the neurons usually are interconnected. That's why they act so coherently as a mass. 
And based on that, exact, so-called exact or next generation neural mass models have been uh, proposed in the recent past that, uh, that claim to describe collective behavior of many neurons exactly, of course, under certain conditions. For example, the model of Ernest Montbrio um, is based on the assumption that first, the single neurons can be described by the quadratic integrate and fire equations. Second, that all the neurons are connected to each other and that the population is quite large. The first two uh, assumptions can be relaxed quite a bit all the way actually to what is what is uh, found in real neural populations, as we have shown in the, in the publication you can see here. Um, so we can actually work with uh, connectivity probabilities of five to 15% and sizes of populations of a few hundreds to a few thousands and still the model is quite accurate. Here you see the equations uh, that have been derived by Ernest Montbrio. So here you see the uh, quadratic integrate and fire or quadratic integration um, differential operator of the mean membrane potential V. The second state variable is the mean firing rate R. As an input, we have a background current, which is Lorentzian distributed with a width eta and, a, and a, no, sorry, with a mean eta and a width delta some external input from elsewhere, of course. Um, we have a time constant that's necessary. And we have the connectivity between the neurons within the population. And this connectivity, of course, is something that is very crucial for the behavior. And it is reasonable to assume that this connectivity is also plastic. It will change or can change according to uh, the activity, which can be described uh, by another set of differential equations like shown here, so that we have um, a second time scale by which the behavior of this uh, system changes. So how can we, well, we have done a lot of research um, investigating how uh, such models, different such models uh, can reproduce actually observable brain dynamics. Here's just one example. Richard Gast, who was a PhD student in my lab, investigated the Montbrio model. Uh, so this is just the behavior of a single Montbrio population. Um, the output depending upon the background input, as you can see here. And you see, depending upon which background input we actually administer, we have um, a stable fixed point. So the system would actually settle down after a while. We would have a limit cycle oscillation, as you can see here. And we also have an area of bistability, which is very crucial. So if I push the system by changing of connectivity or by change of background input over this edge, it would jump down, the oscillation would be quenched. And if I push it over this edge, uh, it would jump up into the limit cycle again and the oscillation resumes. So this hysteresis between a stable limit cycle and a stable uh, fixed point um, can be used to model a number of phenomena, for example, network memory, uh, but also pathological synchrony in epilepsy, for example. Uh, and if we assume plasticity, uh, as I've shown before, of the intrinsic connectivity, then one could also um, model bursting behavior. The system wanders slowly over this bifurcation and then travels back over this bifurcation in a periodic manner. So let's apply uh, this type of modeling to something real. Um, so in this case, we have chosen um, oscillatory activity that is observed in Parkinson's disease. Um, if we want to look at Parkinson's disease, uh, we have to consider the uh, cortex thalamus basal ganglia circuitry as, as sketched here. And one of the basic hubs, or one of the most fundamental hubs of this system is the globus pallidus path externa, here highlighted. This is an inhibitory structure that has very dense interconnections to the rest of the basal ganglia. So 
in especially to the subthalamic nucleus, the striatum, and it is caused influenced by dopaminergic uh, projections by the substantia nigra. In Parkinson's disease, as everybody knows, we have a decrease of dopamine due to uh, death of neurons in the substantia nigra. What is also observed as a biomarker in Parkinson's disease is an increase in beta oscillations and especially also in beta gamma phase amplitude coupling at the cortical, but also at the subcortical levels. So how does that happen? Where are these phenomena generated? The common theory is that they originate in the GPE SDN loop. However, there is some counter evidence. Opto inhibition experiments have shown that inhibiting GPE does quench the beta oscillations, but inhibition of SDN does not. So there is, the, or this gives rise to the hypothesis that uh, GPE alone can produce beta oscillations and um, beta gamma phase coupling, possibly. And uh, this we can investigate with such a model. So we model the GPE. The GPE consists of two different populations, the so-called prototypical and archipelagal cells, which are interconnected like this. We tuned the model according to the rich body of available information on the connectivity, which we see here, for example, the, the probability distributions of connectivities between these two populations, uh, but also physiological measurements. So what kind of uh, activity they would produce and so on. So we tuned that model. Um, like this, and uh, then we look what would it, would it do if we just uh, subject it to any input, would it maybe produce oscillations, would it uh, go through a phase transition, but the answer is no, it wouldn't. It uh, changes firing rates upon input, but it doesn't exhibit any phase transitions. But what we know is that if the dopamine is decreased, that some intrinsic connectivity of the GPE increases. But we do not know which synapses are actually involved. So just we could just try hypothesis in this model. So what about this connectivity? If these synapses are enhanced here, how would the uh, system behavior change? And indeed, what we observe is a bistability between um, a um, stable fixed point as I've shown before, and a limit cycle. So if I now drive uh, one of these populations, preferably the prototypical one, by oscillating input in the beta range from the striatum, then what I see is this modulation here. And if I subject that to a um, cross-frequency uh, coupling analysis, I would observe phase amplitude coupling between beta and gamma oscillation just uh, what has been uh, proposed as a biomarker for Parkinson's disease, for example, also by our group in this uh, publication by Gong et al. Here. So this is uh, this would be an explanation for um, the generation um, of this phenomenon and of the non not being influenced or of the fact that this uh, phenomenon is not being influenced by inhibition of the subthalamic nucleus. If instead I would enhance this connectivity here, we only see um, some gamma oscillation, but not beta uh, gamma phase coupling anymore. So this is an example how we can reproduce relevant dynamic phenomena with such models. However, in, as the ultimate goal, as the holy grail, we are of course interested in brain function in cognitive and information processing operations. There are different levels of brain function that we can distinguish. Starting at a very low level, which we call cognitive primitives with very simple operations like short-term memory, bottom-up gating, so uh, tra transmitting or non-transmitting some input according to its salience, for example, adaptation and so on. And then these can be, um, combined into um, units that produce meta functionality, like gating, top-down gating, change detection, deviance detection, priming, and others. 
And finally, we have high level functionality like language, episodic memory, action planning, and what, what you like. And uh, one question that always arises is where are these different uh, operations implemented? How much is being done at single neuron level, at the level of a single neuronal population, at the level of local circuits of populations, or at the level of large scale networks? So uh, due to my limitations in time, I would like to focus on one of them, that's the local circuitry. And I just give you one example. Um, so on that uh, example considers um, cortical, local cortical wiring. There is this notion of uh, cortical columns. This is a little bit debated, but what is what can be observed is that we have some level of stereotypicity uh, at, uh, in the local cortical wiring. And this implies or suggests that there might be some universal functionality that is used for almost every cognitive operation uh, that is implement lo implemented locally. Yeah? These are the so-called cognitive primitives. Um, in order to uh, model um, such local cortical wiring, or also referred to as local canonical microcircuits, we can use different levels of abstraction. Of course, we have to abstract uh, because we want to filter out what is really common between all cortical circuits rather than all the little gritty de details. The most um, extreme simplification is the one of Robinson, only using one neuron with two types of synapses. Uh, if we distinguish, we can distinguish excitatory and inhibitory neurons like done by David Liley and also our lab. This is the famous Janssen grid circuit with a population of pyramidal cells and excitatory and inhibitory feedback loops. And we can also uh, build more complicated uh, models distinguishing between different layers uh, or even between different types of interneurons as in these publications uh, also from our group. Let me focus on this very widely used model. Tim Kunze, who uh, was a PhD student in my lab has really charted um, the information processing capabilities of uh, this microcircuit in, um, as a function of its parameterization. So here we have the microcircuit again. The input is arriving at layer four, uh, stellate, uh, spiny stellates, which here form the excitatory interneurons. And the output, of course, is provided by the pyramidal cells. So how does the thing behave? If I subject it to a small and brief input, then it will be below threshold. And at the output, we see nothing. So this is unresponsive behavior. Then if I increase the input, I, the input will be transmitted to the output. So I have tra uh, transmission behavior. And if the input is prolonged over a certain time, then the system also transmits the input to the output, but remains in the up state, just memorizing the input. So that is memory behavior. During this memory state, it is this uh, circuit is unresponsive to further input until by a short pulse on the inhibitory interneurons, I erase the memory content again. And if I plot these types of behavior as function of duration and intensity of the input, I get something that we call um, a functional fingerprint. Here we have unresponsive behavior for low intensities. For strong and brief stimuli, we have transmission behavior or transfer behavior. Um, and for strong and long stimuli, we have memory behavior. These ripples here are a special phenomenon. I don't want to talk too much about because it would take technique, uh, yeah, it would take too much time. Um, it is a little bit a question whether this is an artifact of our simplifications or whether this could be really observed in, um, in reality. So in using these uh, microcircuits, yeah, with these uh, um, properties that are represented in the fingerprint, which can be tuned by changing certain properties of the microcircuit, uh, the intrinsic connectivities and also time constants, um, by changing the 
the ratio, for example, between NMDA and AMPA receptors for GABA, that would be one possibility to change time constants. We can build meta circuits. Here, as an example, a meta circuit that performs priming. That means the activation of implicit memory content by primer stimuli that influence the subsequent processing of target stimuli. So for that, we need two circuits. One for memory, we call it memory unit for the higher cortex and the lower cortex for the perception unit. Connected according to the Feynman and Van Essen rules um, from the pyramidal cells to the um, layer four, um, feed forward and feed back from pyramidal cells to pyramidal cells. So how would that behave? If I subject it to a sub-threshold input as before, we would have non-responsive behavior. If I then apply a primer, which is super threshold, then not only the output um, mirrors the input, but also the memory unit is switched into its memory state and then delivers constant input to the pyramidal cells of the perception unit. And for subsequent presentation of the same target stimuli that before didn't produce any signal at the output, we have now have a signal at the output. This is of course a very primitive example with only two units, just information one bit, but you can easily imagine that both the lower and the higher cortex can consist, consist of many of these units that then are then connected in a complex way by a connection matrix. And this way can uh, realize all sorts of complex cross priming phenomena. So this is this was an example how we can um, recreate um, cognitive operations. We have investigated more phenomena, but uh, I would leave it with this at the moment. For the remaining time, I would like to introduce you into another phenomenon and uh, that is an important requisite for modeling global networks. And that is axonal transmission. If you would look, want to look at axonal transmission between neural masses, we cannot only look at single axons, but we have to look at the behavior of axonal bundles. And this is work by Helmut Schmidt, who is, uh, was a postdoc in my lab, is now in Prague. Um, so if you want to look at axon bundles, for, first of all, we need a very efficient model of a single axon, of course. Here we have a myelinated axon, which um, consists of active units located at the nodes of Ranvier, where we have ion channels that uh, produce ion channel currents. And they are connected by these nodes, internodal segments that are just passive leaky cables. Here in an equation, here we have the cable equation, which is parameterized by um, resistances and capacitances and uh, derived time constants and cable constants, which all depend upon the geometry of the cable, the thickness, the thickness of the myelin, and the internodal distance. And so that's the passive transmission. And we have the active units that's like in an in a oil pipeline, the uh, repressurizing units uh, that are located there every few kilometers, uh, where the action potential is actually restored. Here, we can describe the channel dynamics using an Hodgkin-Huxley model. However, because we have that at every node, you would have to solve these equations for every node, which is superfluous because it's stereotypic, it's the same at every node. So we can actually approximate this by a stereotypic response based maybe on an Hodgkin-Huxley model, but also on empirical data. So this combination of stereotypical response at the nodes and uh, these passive cables, we call the spike diffuse spike model, and it's very efficient to compute. Now we can turn to axon bundles. Um, so axon bundles between neural populations have distributed properties. For example, the axonal diameters, um, obey distributions like the one here by um, measured actually in humans by Liebald. So we have distributions of action, uh, axon para, uh, diameters. We also have uh, distributions of node and internode length. And we can also say something about the G ratio. That means the thickness, the relative thickness of the myelination. And you want to translate this whole thing 
into distributions of functional properties like transmission times, but also we would like at spike synchronization and spatial precision. And that, uh, for that, we use the aforementioned spike diffuse spike model of a single axon. And in addition, we have developed a model that mimics an important phenomenon that uh, takes place in uh, bundles of parallel axons. That is a faptic coupling. The influence, um, the activity of one axon influences the activity in other axons. And not going into any detail about the faptic coupling model now for time reasons again, um, but I just tell you the result. Um, so the faptic coupling means that uh, depolarization, that's my mouse here, yeah, depolarization in, ac in, in axonal membranes um, by extracellular potentials caused by other uh, activity in other axons um, changes the transmission velocity. In fact, it increases the transmission velocity. Here is just this example. We have uh, a piece of um, um, an axon bundle which has a length of 10 centimeters with a, such an axon diameter distribution that has been taken from the literature. And this is the resulting delay distributions, distribution. And interestingly, this delay distribution depends on a number of factors. First, it depends on the type of activity on the axon. So if I feed in a uh, volley of action potentials at one end of the, action, uh, of the axon bundle, then um, I can vary the intensity of that volley. That means um, what percentage of the action of the axons is actually carrying, carrying a spike and also the synchronization. So in are all the spikes delivered within one millisecond, two milliseconds, or three milliseconds. And we can also look at different diameters of this bundle. And it turns out that uh, the delay is decreased. Uh, that means the speed is increased uh, depending upon the intensity. The more, the higher the intensity, the more speed up I actually have. The speed up also depends on the uh, synchronization. The most synchronous volley has the highest speed up compared to these. And finally, if you compare the different colors of the curves, uh, the thicker the axon bundle, the more speed up I actually have. So this is um, an, an, a result that tells us that the uh, transmission um, between two neural populations via an axon bundle is quite a complicated transfer function, which needs probably to be taken into account if you want to build whole brain models. And with that, I would like to wrap up, um, providing a summary of what I would like to convey. Neural masses are mathematically and computationally tractable in comparison to large scale models in many cases. They are well suited for the available information that we have in non-invasive brain research. And they are capable of answering many neuroscientific questions. I only have shown a few examples. They provide a low dimensional representation and therefore allow for systematic investigation. So we can use techniques like phase space analysis, bifurcation diagrams, parameter sweeps, and so on, which would be difficult to apply to very high dimensional models. Um, we have seen also in other publications, which I have shown to you now, that they can uh, quite nicely reproduce observable brain dynamics, also of high complexity. Um, what we need, the most crucial ingredients all these models should have is spatial temporal integration, nonlinearity, recurrence, and plasticity. Nice to have would be more detailed descriptions of different layers different neuron types, uh, more fine-grained uh, descriptions of the physiology of neurons actually and others. We studied a lot of different functionalities here. I have just underlined uh, the ones I have um, presented to you now, like working memory, bottom-up gating, priming. We also looked in an initial study to structure building and syntax processing of sentences. Uh, we looked at onset, offset, deviance, omission detection, top-down switching, um, and as you have seen, pathological oscillations in Parkinson's disease. And then I've discussed that uh, delayed long-range coupling through 
um, axon bundles can be modeled uh, efficiently by the spike diffuse spike model of axonal transmission, um, which can take into account um, the velocity distribution and also a faptic coupling and producing interesting and non turbulent effects in the transmission function. As an outlook, um, of course, we always look for further details. We want to know whether the abstraction level we have now is not too abstract. So we are working on uh, in including further details like gap junctions, for example, or conduction-based synapses. Um, we also plan to look at um, local spatial, spatial dimensions. That means um, connectivity, so not only um, this local circuit between five masses, but also adding to this uh, local circuitry a spatial dimension with a distant dependent connectivity. Um, of course, we would like to, and we are also we are already working on this, um, to combine this local circuitry with the fiber bundle models to achieve a real whole brain representation on the population level. And one uh, important uh, direction we, we are going at the moment is um, fusing this type of mechanistic bottom-up approach yeah, that really takes into account the biophysical properties of neurons and so on with more agnostic and uh, amorphic um, top-down approaches. Um, for example, deep neural networks, et cetera, which have shown amazing performances, but need huge amounts of data in order to uh, learn something. And our idea is that uh, constraining and prioritizing uh, such um, yeah, large-scale models uh, with our biophysical models would uh, maybe get us nearer to how the brain is actually working. Yeah, and finally, I would like to thank my collaborators. Here are the ones who really did the work, all the PhD students and postdocs. Here are the other collaborators. And I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, it was a great talk, actually. Thank you for the uh, providing the background for different uh, type of models and then getting into the neural mass model. I think it was very useful for trainees. Um, I have one, I mean, start from high level question. And then if I had time, I go through the some other question, but I'm pretty sure that there are very uh, interested people here like Maurizio and John Griffiths who are professionally working with the neural mass model and they want to, maybe they want to ask questions. So my high level question is that uh, when you, for example, show the, the, I think, I don't know, not uh, uh, slide number 14, but you showed this uh, model for the basal ganglia and GPE, GPE, uh, so my question was that in general, for these type of uh, questions that you have some assumptions. So for example, when you talk about the quadratic integral and fine neural model, you consider this with, for example, all 12 connectivities. Mm -hmm. uh, and now in the outlook that you presented also some future works ingredients that you want to add, you, you would like to add further uh, constraint um, and details. Is there any systematic way that you think that it would be possible to add these kind of details to the neural mass model that you know we can actually follow as instruction to add the stuff to the neural mass model or you you might say you know I may say that you know no this is too much details we really cannot this is the limitation mm. yeah that's a general curse of modeling yeah so modeling needs abstraction that means you have to you have to uh, simplify and uh, omit details um, which makes, which hampers or uh, compromises accuracy, of course, uh, but uh, serves generalizability, okay? Um, and uh, so we have to find this uh, sweet spot, this uh, very subtle balance between complexity and uh, generalizability somehow. And uh, the only way I see to, to decide whether a certain level of detail is really necessary um, is a systematic uh, um, yeah, charting of a model as we have done, uh, for example, in Andreas Spiegler's work about the Janssen grid model, which I haven't shown here, uh, but also by Tim Kunze about the same model, but uh, not concerning the dynamics, but concerning the cognitive operations it can implement. Um, so, I mean, the ultimate 
measure to find out, for example, whether conductance-based synapses are really crucial for modeling. Yeah, they are more realistic, uh, definitely. They are a better account for what actually happens than the current base synapses we are using would be to repeat the whole thing and see what changes. That's the only uh, way I can see. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what I would like to answer to, that, to this. There is no simple answer. It okay. is, it is uh, and there will be always losses if you simplify, and there will be losses if you add details. Um, yeah. The important thing is also to, uh, to be aware of the simplifications when interpreting. Thank you. Uh, Maurizio, please. Thanks, Mila. Thanks, uh, Thomas. Uh, good to see you. Um, so uh, just exactly this uh, these slide, uh, um, clarification here. So the, the, the populations here are inhibitory, right? And all the synapses here are inhibitory synapses. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, how robust uh, is this uh, bursting uh, uh, modulation that you observe? Uh, I could you say something in terms of uh, uh, to what extent uh, the ratio between the synaptic time scales is important in order to observe this modulation? Because I couldn't uh, really avoid to notice that on the lower end. Uh, of your bifurcation gradient, you start with a sudden node on invariant circle bifurcation. So you yeah, actually this, this what you mean, yeah, yeah. right exactly. So actually, yeah. if you go too much towards the lower end, right, you are uh, essentially slowing down the rhythm of oscillations too much, and you risk uh, to not to come back essentially. So I assume that there is a some importance on the time scales uh, of the synaptic uh, connections themselves, uh, more than actually the, the actual strength, or maybe it's a combination of the two factors. Yeah, uh, the synaptic time scale. Um, I mean, here we just took the um, known synaptic dynamics of GABAergic synapses, okay? Um, we, we didn't actually vary this parameter. So what would happen if I would have a lot of GABA B con, uh, receptors there or something like that? Um, but uh, I would agree that um, the bifurcation diagram would probably change upon this variation. Yeah. Okay, and what about the effect of hepatic transmission is that within the single population. So have you thought about the possibility that, you know, even neurons that are uh, nearby to each other influence uh, their own excitability through hepatic somehow transmission? Mm -hmm. that, that's a very important point. That's, um, I mean, a faptic transmission between neurons, um, we haven't thought about so much, but uh, you also have gap junctions, for example, right? They are similar, yeah. So they just couple the neurons uh, very tightly to to each other. Um, we didn't look at this either, um, but uh, one similar factor is, of course, the uh, J, so the the within neuron uh, uh, connectivity or within population connectivity, uh, which uh, somehow, um, yeah. Uh, describes how much one neuron describes the, uh, or influences the excitability of another neuron in the population, right? Um, yeah, this, uh, in, in, in this simulation, we didn't look at this, but in the one here, um, this is actually what we did, right? So here, yeah, this connectivity is basically this J, uh, which we modulated. So we can, we considered, so first, first we, uh, we tuned the whole model so that it reproduces everything that is observable uh, from the animal literature. But then we looked at uh, what would happen if you would increase this, for example, right? And uh, so we just assumed, okay, maybe the dopaminergic uh, change, the decrease of dopamine is changing uh, this synaptic efficacy, thereby, yeah, more tightly coupling this population to, to itself. 
And yeah, this is the result. It uh, starts to, to oscillate, to produce gamma oscillations. Um, but it didn't um, show this um, influenceability by, by extrinsic input so that we can't explain this beta gamma uh, phase amplitude coupling anymore. That was the result here. It is a little bit the curse of uh, such modeling that you can always come up with um, additional modulations that you could try out. And uh, yeah. the typical question, what would happen if you would do this? Yeah, I think that, so I guess my, then I leave the, 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 the stage to, to the others. But I mean, my, my, my question was, was also in the direction of thinking about, so to what extent actually would you consider a path A transmission uh, in terms of uh, spatial scales? I mean, is it like important locally or to what extent it becomes actually distally uh, remarkable? It is, I think it's a great question. I would like to know more about uh, as well. So we only started, started with this effective uh, business uh, with this project uh, of the long range fiber bundles. Yeah. And there it turned out that it is really a, a factor. It, it, mm -hmm. I mean, a factory coupling, coupling has been shown before already in the 1940s, but these were isolated axons um, embedded in, in some stuff and some paraffin or so. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, by the way, that they find opposite effects. They find no. a, a not a acceleration, but a decrease of the velocity. And our model would also, for such cases where you have isolated um, axons in 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 a in an infinite medium, uh, would also predict the same thing. But packed together by the by by many of them in an axonal bundle, the behavior is quite different. Actually, the opposite. I think that's a very interesting finding. Hey, thanks. Great. Uh, thanks, Thomas and Maurizio. Uh, John Griffiths has two questions. Uh, and uh, so, John, do you want to ask your questions? Want me to go through? John, do you want to ask questions? So, okay, I go. Uh, so, I just uh, read. Uh, just chat. So we thank you. Super work as always. Uh, okay, so Milad, I can okay. I can join in. Yeah. Um, Hi, I have my hands full just now. Hi, Thomas. Good to see you. Um, see you. So yeah, I mean, I had two questions. Um, I'll just I'll just kind of do them in order. The first one was about the um, <clears throat> axonal transmission, um, and I'm sure you know this, but um, I find that a lot of people are kind of unaware of the proportion of unmyelinated neurons there are in the central nervous system. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of microscopy work kind of puts the numbers at almost as high as 50%, depending on the brain region. And then, mm -hmm. of course, you have de un demyelinating diseases that probably increase that number. And we still don't really know how that works over kind of healthy aging, but likely there's kind of stripping away remyelinations. So kind of those unmyelinated neurons matter a lot, right? There's at least yeah. there's, there's probably quite a lot of them. So have you thought about how that would play out in the model? I mean, the model would actually be able to, uh, to accommodate unmyelinated axons as well. We also did that. Um, but what we didn't do is uh, looking at uh, their bundle behavior yet. Uh, this is simply how I mean that. There's so many things to do well. This is sensible to do. But uh, yeah, yeah, um, still to be done. Um, it's also uh, I find it interesting what you're saying. Um, I was always wondering, um, so how many of them are actually for, at a long range bundle? Just uh, consider, for example, the accurate fasciculus or something like that, uh, or the corpus callosum. What you say, ten to forty percent, even in these long range bundles? Yeah. So. Um... So there's there's work for from a guy called um uh it's Peter's a surname, I forget his first name. Um Peters. And yeah, Peters. And he, he did a lot of uh light and electron microscopy work kind of in the in the nineties and the and the noughties um on on aging and also just on um 
the distribution structure of axons in macaques, mm -hmm. not not in human postmortem, but in in primates, um, which you know, kind of quite a they, they can do the electron microscopy in primates. You can't really do that in humans because you have to fix the tissue, so they mm -hmm. can see the smaller fibers. So you really you really need electron microscopy data to see the really small ones. Mm -hmm. um, which probably means you need to use non-human primates. Uh, but yeah, like some of some of the regions that they look, they're, they're really high, like 40, 50%. Um, and it goes up um, the older the animal is. This is, uh, this is super interesting. Uh, could you maybe uh, send, send me a link uh, to yeah, one sure. of the publications or something? Um, because it's so difficult to find real... Um, uh, anatomical information about fiber bundle uh, geometry, especially uh, diameter distributions, but also myelination uh, percentages and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, there's 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 more now. I mean, you you know about this because you, you you're working closely with the microstructure imaging community. <laughs> yeah. There's been a bit of a revival in white mm. matter anatomy that's kind of come in lockstep with with the yeah, well, progress in, in the MRI. Yeah, and the MRI, does, uh, the, this, uh, these endeavors to measure these microstructural properties uh, of uh, white matter in the MRI are, you know, a bit double-edged. Um, there is some progress, but uh, you know about uh, Excalibur and stuff, yeah. And yeah. it turns out that uh, it is quite limited to only the biggest axons. Which is still yeah. relevant. Um, so, I mean, the key question that now remains um, are these largest axons that really uh, our measurements are sensitive to? Are they very, have, do they have special relevance? It could be because right. they're the fastest. Um, that is something uh, that is also um, somebody could sit down and find out which part of the uh, so for, for cognitive operations, which part of the uh, of the diameter distribution is really relevant? Well, it, obviously for synchrony, you know, the slow ones are going to be useless because they're going to be, this is the interesting thing, like those unmyelinated fibers, they're so slow, right? Yeah. So if there's lots of them, then for a couple of, you know, like five to 10 millimeters, it's going to be kind of north of 100 milliseconds delay. Um, mm. So you've got just this, and, and it's kind of like, slow burn nudge rather than any kind of fast you know yeah, but that could also have a functional meaning yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. not only the, the speed but also the uh, duration of some operation or the temporal yeah temporary extent or uh, that would matter so um it's a, it's difficult to imagine that they are completely useless right they must play some role because there's so many of them right i think that's the you, you kind of hit the nail on the head with the with the microstructure imaging is we see the largest ones and maybe the largest ones are super important but there's a lot more small ones <laughs> yeah. yes. and uh, yes. and then the, the microstructure imaging struggles to see the small myelinated ones it has no chance of seeing the small unmyelinated ones yeah, yeah. that's that's true okay yeah I'm looking forward to this uh to this uh this link uh let's okay. see whether and increase. Uh, well, and I'll go. I'll go with my second question. I'll be a bit quicker this time. Um, yeah. uh, so, so the, the the new the new kid on the block in neural mass modeling is the exact models, right? Um, wow. And you've been pushing it forward along with other people. And it, it, this really is, you know, getting a lot of attention from the from all corners of the community. Um, so the question is like, is or some of our workhorse neural mass models that are of the phenomenological type, like Janssen Rip model, which you showed some about here, and you've done a lot of, you know, fundamental work on over the years, is that going to be with us for the foreseeable future still, or do you think that kind of the next generation Janssen Rip model will be the one that we care about uh, sometime very soon in terms of the kind of phenomena that it's usually been useful for, like rhythms and evoke responses? Mm. This question can be answered in two ways. So what would I predict would happen and what would I like to happen? Um, um, the first one, it's difficult to answer, but the other one, um, I think uh, the Montpellier model is, um, is a 
is a better account um, of uh, the behavior of a neural population. And therefore, one should replace the simple Janssen RIT model by this one. Because the Janssen RIT model is essentially a sub thresh, I mean, it can be derived from a leaky integrated fire model under the assumption that most of the time the cells are not firing. And the second assumption is that the cells are not interconnected in a recurrent fashion. So they are like parallel channels. If you, if you take these two assumptions, then it's also an exact model. Um, but these are very, very hard assumptions, uh, which are very unrealistic ones, especially the second one. There, there, therefore, um, I see no reason, uh, no disadvantage of the Montpellier model, for example, uh, compared to the classical uh, Jensen grid model. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then your prediction, I guess, was the other side of it. The prediction that uh, you have some in the community and, you know, yeah, uh, still lots of people using sphere models for source localization in EEG and MEG. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for giving me the, the mic, uh, Milad. Um, see you around, Thomas. Thanks. Uh, we have... Uh... It was a very attractive talk, uh, Thomas, so you have many questions. Uh, okay, so uh, we have one question actually from Dr. Uh, William Hodgson. Um, uh, William, Bill, do you want to ask your question? I go or um, I go. Sure, sure. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your uh, talk. I enjoyed it very much because I am not a modeler. I'm an experimentalist, um, but I'm interested both in the Parkinson's model that you presented uh, based on this Wolfgang Plentz uh, STN GPE oscillator. This is very interesting to me. Um, and also the top-down models. I'm interested in the influence of uh, top-down control in Parkinson's disease. I mainly record in the human, so I find modeling an important supplement because we can't really do a lot of detailed experiments. But um, the one question I specifically did have, and it's sort of a newer area is, is maybe you know, I mean, I can also do a PubMed search, but I'm interested in the intralaminar centromedian, these thalamic nuclei, because they have a very strong relationship with the striatum. And mm -hmm. specifically, are you aware of any intralaminar thalamic nuclear models that are looking at sparse coding and how that may interplay? Because we see a lot of, of this uh, just directly theta, gamma, um, you know, uh, oscillations coupling, like mm -hmm. nested oscillation coupling in some of our LFP and single unit work. Um, are you aware of uh, any centromedia, interlaminar thalamo striatal models? Yeah, the short answer is uh, unfortunately not. I'm not aware, uh, aware of any such models. Um, but I find it interesting that you also observe phase amplitude coupling, uh, in this case, theta gamma, right, in, um, in the subthalamic nucleus. Um, and one question I would have, uh, I just played one question back. Um, are these uh, phenomena um, dopamine dependent? Um, yes, yeah, so we, we have done, we are able to do some uh, experiments where on we do the DBS operation on the second side, we can give levodopa, but the most of the, the patients for the, intra, the central median, those are epilepsy patients. So um, the model may have more application to, to that and also maybe more in the cognitive realm actually. Um, so so they're, they're, I'm sorry, I think I, I was talking about the Parkinson's disease with relationship to the basal ganglia. The CM is also involved, but actually the clinical application is more for uh, for epilepsy. I so, see, I see, I see. Yeah. Um, I mean, this uh, whole basal ganglia cortical thalamic circuit is infinitely complicated, and uh, mm -hmm. we just picked out this one thing here um, to demonstrate uh, um, a phenomenon that we are particularly interested in. You might have noticed that we also uh, did some research, there are two publications uh, where we looked at uh, cortical theta gamma, you know, theta gamma co coupling as a biomarker for Parkinson's disease. Um, and yeah, uh, 
Yeah, but the, um, okay, and, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. and that's why we, got, we were so much interested in this particular phenomenon. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Francis, sorry. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, first of all, thank you for our excellent talk. I mean, it was really nice to sort of get the background and the context. And I resonated with a lot of what you said in terms of the sweet spot in terms of, you know, simplified and detailed models it sort of reminds me of one of Eve's comments in her papers about the trying to find the inflection point of, you know, where, where more detail is not helpful, but then you need. So, I mean, it's a challenge and I mean, mm -hmm. unfortunately, no easy answers. So I had a, a specific question and just I just um and a, a comment. So at the very end, you you mentioned about the critical ingredients being with the neural mass models of I think it said spatial temporal um, mm -hmm. aspects. And and I guess I just wanted you to expand on that uh, just to make sure I followed. Uh, uh, yeah, right. Spatial temporal integration as crucial ingredient. So are you saying that you need to have um, you know, so you have your neural mass models, so it's just these activities. So the spatial aspect, you mean? A crucial ingredient in your view is that you have to have more than two um, bundles or, or neural mass populations. You know, so for example, if you have like a three cell network, um, you know, each one is a certain um, a different cell population type. That's mm -hmm. not space. That's not spatial yet. So I just wanted to make sure I understood what you meant by spatial temporal. But it, 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 it is it is a primitive uh, form of spatial integration. Okay. And it, yeah, so it is already spatial integration. You integrate uh, uh, information from different neuronal populations. Okay, okay. So that's what you meant by the interpretation. Okay, so just to clarify that. The other, the specific question I had was in terms of your phase amplitude coupling. So um, when you look at these uh, cross-frequency coupling, right, there's different metrics people use, as, as, as I'm sure you know, and I could look at your paper in more detail for that mm -hmm. specific point. But did you use like the tort type analyses to... Uh, to measure the phase amplitude coupling in the modeling, because the reason I ask is because you know we're doing these different types of models and looking at cross frequency coupling, and depending on the level of detail in the model, the metric to use is you know helpful or not. So, mm -hmm. did you use sort of the tort type cross phase amplitude coupling metric here, and was it appropriate for these sort of neural mass models? I guess, or did you use a different form of metric? Um, I mean, for the for the, for the neural mass models, we can use the same metric as we use for the normal. Um, okay, so that was fine. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Just because, of course, the it even works better with the neural mass models than in reality, where you have lots of noise and everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the details about how we how we gauged uh, phase amplitude coupling you can really see in these two Gong papers. Okay. Uh, Gong et al. Um, Twenty one and twenty two. Okay. Um, okay. All right. We'll look there. Yeah, because I mean, it, it sort of gets into this interpretation of you know what is representing experimentally versus in the model these sort of you know yeah. inputs, right? And so of when, course we have to measure it the same way. Otherwise, yeah. we can't see say we are mimicking the same phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So there's a, just a lot of interpretation that goes into these sort of simplified models. But of course, we need the simplified model to be able to do the analyses in the first place. So this is kind of where the, the challenge comes about in this. OK, so I'm going to not go on too much. I just wanted to clarify that and just sort of thank you. And I really resonate with the things you said. So thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Perfect. So we had all the questions from, from PIs and profs. So any question from trainees? Seems our trainees are shy, probably. Anyways, so it seems there is uh, there are no further questions. Uh, and thank you again, Thomas, for your time. I really appreciate it. It was great, great talk. We really enjoyed. Uh, and uh, yeah, hope to see you soon again. And uh, I wanted to just say that you know it was a great uh, pleasure to have you. And yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank yeah. you very much for having me. It was a pleasure for me too and a nice discussion. Thank you. Okay. Have a good CNN. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.